there were three clear and elevating goals at the beginning of this thing for me. The first was no COVID in our patient population. The second, no layoffs and no wage cuts. We're not going to lay anybody off and we're not cutting any wages. And then the third, which really is the first and is uh, foundational to the other two in some important ways, is that our relationships would be as strong, if not stronger, on the other side of that. And that's not just our relationships as team members and with our patients, but with our community and business partners and others. Welcome to a and Healthcare Industry Group's What's Your Moonshot podcast series, where world-class healthcare leaders seek to solve big problems. Listen as we talk to today's health system CEOs about the journey to achieve their moonshots. Welcome to A&M's What's Your Moonshot podcast. My name is John Masudi. I'm a senior director with Alvarez and Marsal in Denver in the health industry group. Today, I'm joined by my co-host, Larry Kaiser, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon and a managing director with A&M. Our guest today is Dr. Jan Dell Allen Davis. Dr. Alan Davis is the CEO of Craig Hospital, a spinal rehabilitation hospital in Denver that specializes in neuro rehabilitation and research of brain and spinal cord injuries. Good morning and welcome to the podcast, Dr. Jandell Allen Davis. Thanks, John. Um, it's nice to be here and it was nice to be asked. Thank you. Well, Jandell, we are very pleased to have you with us today to participate. Um, in this podcast series. And in this series, we focus on a moonshot that a healthcare leader has set out to accomplish um, and and to make a real impact on their organization, their community, or across the broader industry. Dr. Alan Davis, although you started your medical career in practice, I'm sure like all of us, you could never have imagined the pandemic that we were hit with in 2020 and that we are obviously still in today, although hopefully, going down a little bit now that most people are getting vaccinated. But on top of that, managing a hospital and trying to ensure your patients and employees safely, safety during some of these uh, most unprecedented times. With that as a backdrop, can you tell us a little bit about your moonshot, if you will, aiming to have COVID cases across your patient population remain at zero from the onset of the pandemic until now, and how successful have you been with that? Obviously, others have struggled with that uh, as well. So tell us a little bit about what you've been able to do. Sure. Well, first of all, uh, again, uh, thanks so much for the time together with you, Larry. And, you know, it's a kind of crazy thing that you think about what a moonshot is. And I did get a chance to take at least a quick gander at some of the other topics that you all have undertaken in terms of how folks uh, think about moonshot. This was not one that I ever would have uh, imagined in my wildest dreams that I'd uh, uh, be confronting. I, I have a strong belief, all that said, that there are leaders for a time. Like you end up in the place you do because of some sort of unforeseen or unseen um, um, sort of need or calling. And I love where I get to practice here at Craig Hospital um, in the CEO and president role. Um, given the unique nature of who we serve and how we uh, provide that service, it was absolutely <laughs> unsettling to find ourselves um, facing this uh, incredibly uh, deadly and dangerous uh, virus that we've been up against. And um, I can, re- I've been recent sort of months began to um, characterize what we're doing in this way, because I do believe this is our hurricane, our tsunami, you name it. This is the disaster that's been, um, that's been laid at the feet of healthcare. And in acute care hospitals, if you use the firefighter um, analogy, their job is to contain the fire, or that is contain the virus within some um, part of their hospital. The fact is that in acute care hospitals, that's where people go to get treated for COVID. We have to keep our fi- our forest um, virgin, virginal. We cannot let fire in at all. And so it's been an interesting uh, space to occupy in terms of uh, being that uh, first line of defense for our patients. And really, we know that one of the critical parts then of fighting the fire is how I behave, my teammates and I, the thousand plus employees of our, us here, let alone the consultants and others who come in to care for our patients. Um, we've got to be pretty careful about how we interact out in the community. And I can tell you that um, here it is, whatever day it is, uh, November 2nd, we're 22 months at least into this um, a particular time and we've had no cases of COVID in our patient population. And relative to, not at all surprisingly, 
acute care hospitals and certainly relative to long term care facilities um, and sort of the, the SNFs, the skilled nursing facilities and some other sorts of post acute uh, rehab facilities. Uh, we've had precious few cases in our uh, employee population as well. So, to the extent that it's a moonshot that not, it's not 1 that was on my bucket list. It's a moonshot. I think we're. You know, we continue every day to just count our blessings, I, I believe, and still say it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And I sure hope that we can get on the other side of that and say it never became a matter of when. So it would get into the hospital. That's fantastic, Jandell. And you've done a really incredible job there at Craig, keeping your patients safe. What were the most important principles that you followed and in, in, in achieving this great success? Yeah, so, first of all, I had 3 clear and elevating goals that, um, uh, sort of, it wasn't like the moment they said, we are now in an emergency. I knew this was the 3, you know, it took a, a, at least a couple of weeks to kind of really be in it and actually deal with the shock, both personally and professionally, organizationally, globally, community wise, what we found ourselves in. But there were 3 clear and elevating goals at the beginning of this thing for me. The 1st was no COVID in our patient population. The 2nd. Um, and we understood very clearly the economic um, uh, implications of how we chose to enter this um, this particular emergency. We being we as a globe, we as a society, with this huge and abrupt economic shutdown of the economy. Um, I said no layoffs and no wage cuts. We're not going to lay anybody off, and we're not cutting any wages. Knowing that 1 of the risks that we ran was that we would see census drop because of where 50% of our uh, little cl our close to 500 patients come from out of state. So, would people actually still want to come or would it be safe or even possible? But I said, I'm not laying anybody off and we're not going to cut any wages. And we're blessed to be in a, the kind of uh, financial um, situation where we could do that. And then the third, which really is the first and is uh, foundational to the other two in some important ways, is that our relationships would be as strong, if not stronger, on the other side of that. And that's not just our relationships as team members and with our patients, but with our community and business partners and others. And so those have been sort of my um, clear and elevating goals, and the team uh, completely embraces them. But then the other was in terms of managing the day to day, whether it was, how are you going to manage finances? If the, if the ship gets a little rocky, or how are you going to manage work from home? You know, the administrative folks who are able to knowing that there are many who don't have a choice. They have to come to work. Um, I, I remember taking a walk and saying, it's really going to be about while I was on a walk one morning. I said, you know, when you get to these, this is situation management 101 is what are your values? What are the values you want to use to. Um, actually enter this. And by the time I got home from that 4 mile walk, I had them down. The 1st was safety and it wasn't just safety from this virus, but it was psychological safety, which is um, part of the foundation and the, the culture of Craig. But what's going to be super important when you're fighting something like this is that people have the ability and are actually encouraged and expected to speak up. The 2nd was um, equity that we were going to do all and only what was needed to keep everybody as safe and as whole and as supported as possible. The third was fairness. And I had to remind myself of that this morning um, because we're in round whatever of this pandemic and we've got a few people who have chosen not to get vaccinated. Um, most are saying, fine, I won't, I'll do the exemption and I'll get tested. But we've got a couple people who've said, I'm not going to get tested. And I say, everybody takes a haircut. That's how fairness works. We're all going to have to feel some pain in this, um, not because, and not in any intentional way, but because of the, the incredible complexity and complicatedness that we're swimming in. Um, the fourth was trust, that I will always tell the truth, and, I'm, and I do that, I hope, anyway, um, but be um, overly transparent in terms of what we know, what we don't know, but also um, invite people into the conversation to help us solve to the problems that we're facing, because as one of our docs reminded us at the very beginning of this, remember, we've never done this before. <laughs> we've never done this before. And then the last one was sustainability. And when I think about sustainability, I think about it in terms of um, the business, because this is a, a vitally important um, hospital in terms of what it does, how it does it for patients who woke up with one reality and went to bed with a very different one. But also sustainability of our emotional and social well-being, and and health as we uh, walk through this, 
And what I'd say on the other side of it is um, because I work alongside an incredible group of people uh, that we have uh, managed to get here where we find ourselves today and we'll just call victory today and leave it at that um, because we've let those, those values um, guide our practices and our principles and our decision making. So. so you touched on it a little bit, but tell me a little bit about the impact on your staff that your strategies and some of these operational changes that you had to make. And we've heard so much about burnout in staff and maybe it's a little bit less in, in the type of hospital that you run, but how did you ensure that your workforce productivity remained intact and that the morale remained intact across the, the organization? And it sounds to me like you didn't mandate vaccination, but tell me a little bit about how you, you encourage people. Sure. So actually we are, let me just say, I'll start from the end just to dispense with it. There is a um, order. It is mandated here in Colorado that from our health department that um, there's vaccines you can, that you have to be vaccinated against COVID, um, but there are medical and religious exemptions um, allowed within the state. So that's how we're sort of managing through that. Um, you know, Craig is this really um, special place, Larry. I, you know, I was at Kaiser Permanente for 24 and a half years, a place that has a strong uh, belief around this notion of coordinated patient and family centered care. And I will tell you, and I practiced for 25 years, OBGYN, don't ask, doesn't make sense that I'm in a neuro rehab hospital, but there you are. Um, there's a way that care is delivered here, is embraced here, that's way more akin to certainly how I practiced during that 25 years, but I have never, and in that spirit, I've never seen or worked in an environment where patients and families truly are at the center of everything we do in a sense that allows um, um, these great clinicians to have the autonomy that's needed to do what's right for an individual practice. Um, we work uh, to the, we try to work off of the evidence where it exists um, in the field. It is as team-based and multidisciplinary an effort as I've ever seen. Um, I like to say we have standardized an approach to the care um, in order to customize that care based on what um, individual patients and families need. And it also is a place, surprisingly, that's full of a ton of joy. I remember I say it's not pixie dust that's sprinkled on you when you come in the door, but you can feel a difference in the culture. It's a very casual but not careless place in terms of our how we dress. I am a leader who walks around a ton. I don't know the names of a thousand people, but I know the names of a ton of them and know their stories. And it was as important, then back to your question, um, during this time to make sure that I was super visible. We have used this wonderful and yet also maddening thing called Zoom as a way to stay very, very much connected to people. Um, so we use the virtual, but also the walking around. I think the hardest thing for the team, and there has, it's an interesting way burnout is played out here. Cause if you think about it, it takes a lot of energy to keep a fire out. <laughs> um, it's a different kind of energy than it is to kind of keep a fire contained. And, um, this place, I remember when I first got here, I said, this place is crazy. Are kids running down the halls? Because it's very much patient and family-centered care. Families, especially young families, because the average age of our patients is 39. When they come to do the rehabilitation, it is family rehab. Because these are devastating injuries, as you well know, given your specialty. Um, and so there usually are kids that I have a chance to interact with. There's, we have a really robust uh, pet therapy program. The place is just always bustling with activity. And we had to shut that down at the beginning of this. One of the hardest days of my adult, I'd say professional career was having to stand in front of families and tell them, you have to go home. We don't know enough about this virus to know how to keep you safe. But I know if it gets in this hospital, given that this is a long-term care hospital, that it could spread like wildfire and we could find ourselves shut down. And in that case, patients aren't gonna be able to have access to this great care for some period of time. And more importantly, back to sustainability of the business. Uh-oh. <laughs> so anyway, um, the way that we have kept people's spirits up is to be very much present, very much um, um, accessible. My door, and people know this about me, my door is always open literally and figuratively. And to actually show um, vulnerability myself, which is, I think, also uh, part of the heart of, I like to think, good physicians is to be able to say when you don't know and to be able to 
make sure that you're standing by and standing alongside people. I had a call last week. Um, we have a weekly or every other week now, a Zoom all staff meeting to bring people up to speed. And I had to join this one a tiny bit late and clearly joined at a tense moment where there was some pushback that was going on with one team member and had to de-escalate that. But then at the end went on to just sort of talk about how there are nights that I'm tired and frustrated too. In fact, I had to kind of not choke up, but I did choke up. And I said, you know, bottom line is aside from my house, this is the safest place I feel on this planet right now is what coming here and thanking, you know, to, to express a ton of gratitude because I know the personal sacrifices, let alone the professional, because people can't practice the way they used to. We can't do off campus um, outings to ball games and to the theater and lots of things that are really important in terms of uh, the therapeutic process um, out of fear of what's going on. And it gets a little old for folks, but I'm um, more, um, I'm really humbled um, and impressed at how we have adapted and learned how to do some of the very same things that we did off campus, on campus. And, you know, in a sense, the proof in the pudding, and we will be doing our employee set survey in the coming weeks, which I do anticipate engagement to be a little bit lower. But I get to walk around and see that the place is still um, joyful, that people are still smiling, and probably, the, I say, this is like chocolate to me, is when people say, thank you for keeping us safe. So they get it. I mean, we're, we're rational adults uh, for the most part. Thank you for keeping us safe is probably, I go home when that those words are uttered, and I go, okay, you did your best today, and that's all you can. Probably the hardest thing I think for leaders at a time like this is to figure out what you own and what you have to just not, because there is a piece of this where we all have to manage our own morale. But trust me, that's the one that keeps me the most um, um, sort of awake and somewhere between anxious and energized is, is there something more that I should be or could be doing? And when I do the whole thinking and walk through my head, and this is what I told the team last week, I say, is there something more you can be doing? I don't think so. Um, is, is, is the house still safe? Yeah. Can you own all this? No. And then I go rinse and repeat. Just keep telling yourself that and get up every morning and do your, your level best. So that's how I, we've done it. And I think we're doing okay. We're doing okay. And families are still incredibly grateful at what and how our teams are interacting with them, which is also an important uh, test of how folks are doing. I think what's so critically important is that you were out there and that the people could see you and that I think in a situation like this, that is just so critically important for people to see you're just as engaged as, as they are. Have, have the changes that you made, um, it did affect operations initially, but are you seeing now that you're pretty much back to, uh, to where you were in terms of operations? Uh, and other issues. Yeah, you know, the surprising thing, and it's an interesting uh, business or operation story as well. I was told when I got here that, oh, that, well, there's, there's seasonality to the census here. I said, that doesn't make sense. People hurt themselves all the time. I mean, people drive all the time, and half of the, practically half of the injuries that land folks here are motor vehicle accidents. So it didn't make sense to me that there should be seasonality, that it falls off in the winter months. Um, it certainly can pick up in the summer as we see sports injuries and water related accidents happening, but um, actually only about 12 to 15% of the admissions here are due to sports injury. So we actually started a bunch of work when I first got here on making sure that uh, we were thinking about Craig's brand. We started doing uh, more advertising and marketing, um, really bolstered up and supported our um, uh, provider relations teams in some different ways. Because it didn't make sense to me that it should fall. And when we entered this pandemic, it was frightening. We saw some record low census for reasons that still today are not, um, I can't explain. So we came into this um, having had a couple of really tough months. Um, and I thought, holy cow, this could be, <laughs> this could be really bad. And it turns out that by May, the census um, rallied, which is about when we start to see it rally anyway. And we have had, for the first time in Craig's history, um, sustained high census. And we're a 92 bed hospital and we staff for 88. And we've been running average daily census in the 82 to 83 range pretty much since last um, um, May. At first, I thought it was the uh, 
COVID is that the hospital, the acute care hospital said, we've got to get, we need to free up beds, make sure we have beds in the event that there was a surge. Well, we really never, although we may be in one right now, we actually didn't encounter much of a surge in Denver or Metro Denver or Colorado last um, spring. So this is spring of 20. So, I, you know, I was, I was willing to chalk it up to the, uh, the COVID uh, crisis at the beginning of it, but it doesn't make sense that we have uh, continued to have great census numbers, record census numbers, and therefore record financial and uh, performance as well in these uh, uh, this last year and a half. And I kept waiting for it to fall off, and it hasn't. Now we've got a new challenge, which everybody does, sadly, um, is that we have been victims of what's going on with staffing as well. And so we did actually have to cap census because you got to have people to staff your beds. We're looking good again. So, um, so for about a couple months, we actually capped cap census at 80. And we did get it. That was a little bit of an ouch on the finances, but this place is so financially strong. I, I inherited a wonderful place to my, I always told the last couple CEOs, I said, my job is not to break it. So I'm yeah. hoping you're not. Um, so it's been, uh, it's been interesting um, and I, and it's still a little bit, I can't explain why census has been strong. I don't doubt that COVID is playing some role in it, but we've also had new competitors come into this market um, in the inpatient rehab facility space that have you know, sort of rocked our world a little bit, but so far we're still doing good. And I think that's just because the folks who care for these patients are just amazing and Craig has a strong brand. Well, Jan Dell, it, it's been great spending time with you this morning, and it, this has been a real showcase for the great work that Craig Hospital does, but also the incredible leadership that you've brought to that place, and and that leadership makes a difference. And I really appreciate you spending time with us this morning. Well, John, you and I have been partners for a long, long time, colleagues for a long time prior to where we both landed, and you know we certainly had the um, opportunities within Kaiser Permanente to to witness great leadership and um, also ways in which that perhaps we could uh, learn from some of the tougher challenges that what we've seen over both our clinical and our clinical practices, let alone in this one. And it is an honor and a privilege to get to do what I do every single day. And to the extent that there's um, some lessons learned in this that I can share, I'm, I'm just happy to do it. It was, it was a great opportunity to hang out with you. Well, Jantel, we really appreciate uh, you joining us. They're lucky to have you, and your really your leadership is inspired, and I think it has truly benefited the hospital. So, thank you very much for participating with us today. Well, thank you, and um, be well. Above all else, let's just be well and keep hanging in. All right. Great. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Alvarez and Marcel, leadership, action, results. Well, John, first of all, um, thank you for um, securing Jen Dell. I, I, I thought she had some really great comments and it, it's a real testament to her leadership uh, as to how successful they've been in keeping those patients safe. So these are patients who are vulnerable, families, and somehow uh, she managed to uh, to hold this all together and, stum and and maintain really the morale of the staff. But a lot of this is is really due to her leadership and her ability to be out there. Um, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I've known Jan Dell for 15 years and she's always had that. She's always had this empathy and strength and humility and it really shows i mean here she is she said i don't want to talk about it but she, she's an OBGYN running a spinal rehabilitation hospital and she's done a phenomenal job she's gained the trust of her people she was faced pretty early in her tenure with one of the biggest disasters in healthcare in the last 50 years and and she's handled it incredibly well it hit them right where their strength was, which was a, a family environment. And they had to pull back on that and they still maintained their their strength and their brand. And it's it's really a great story. And I think it does underscore her abilities as a leader. Number one, that she's in that position. She clearly has the, the, the capability to do this, but I think it's that personal side that really comes out 
And I think that really shows. And I, and I think she, she's been able to, to get her people really behind her and they stepped up uh, at a time when they really needed to, as you point out, with this incredible disaster that we have, this, this pandemic. Um, and, and, and her folks stepped up because uh, they saw that, that she's the kind of leader that they can get behind.